Hello and welcome to another discussion here at Eyes to the Sky. I'm meteorologist Chris Lasakis and today I would like to discuss with you height falls. Many of you have probably heard or read a discussion concerning height falls and how height falls affect tornado outbreaks or the chance for severe convection. This is a discussion I've been wanting to do for quite some time so figured I'd just start doing some some more videos discussing just various meteorological topics, do short videos and just jump right on in. So today we're going to be discussing this idea of height falls. So when you hear the term height falls, uh, think of you being at one location with time and the geopotential heights fall over you or the numerical value gets lower and lower. In other words, the atmosphere gets thinner. So the distance from the ground to a certain pressure level in the atmosphere decreases the thickness or the depth between those two points. And what that causes is a slope surface where you get ascent, you get front genetical circulations and, um, and things like that, that that help to cause lift, what we call QG ascent, quasi-geostrophic forcing. I'm not gonna go into all that at depth right now, but typically it is taught within, and it's true, typically it's taught within um, academia, the pedi uh, pedagogically, or how do you say that, that, um, height falls cause rising motion and it and they do it's true so but specifically i want to go over with you what exactly happens when you don't have height falls how can you still get violent tornado outbreaks without height falls and it's true that you actually can and so this is really in my opinion a really fascinating discussion um about about that and what it can mean if you don't have height falls and yet you have a ton of cape, you have a ton of wind shear, what can happen? And I wanna go over three examples with you. And there's actually a lot more examples I could do. Um, there's dozens, I've seen dozens of cases like this. And some of you probably have too. Uh, but the first one I wanna cover with you is April 3rd, 1974. So the super outbreak of 74, an incredible case um, where the heights fell extremely minimally and over the threat area. That's, that's another criterion that I should establish before really getting into this discussion much, is when I refer to there being or not being height falls, we're gonna talk about over the threat area. And so um, let me go ahead and outline the threat area. Of course, you guys know where the super outbreak of 74 happened. It was roughly this area right in through here, um, from central Mississippi, central Alabama, all the way north into the northern Ohio Valley, southern lakes region, and really into Ontario, Canada. Uh, that This little portion of, of the lakes portion of Ontario, Canada. Anyway, the core of the outbreak was right in through here. So I'd like for you to watch this 936 uh, height contour. Of course, that stands for 9360 or 9360 geopotential meters. And what geopotential meters are, guys, is just the height from the uh, from sea level to that particular pressure surface. So in this example, we're looking at the 300 millibar chart. It would be the vertical distance in meters from sea level to 300 millibars is 9,360 meters. Remember, we leave off, um, this is in decameters, so it's in tens. We leave off that last zero. So you just multiply this value times 10. And that's the number of meters from sea level, always keep that in mind, to your uh, pressure level in question, which is 300 millibars. Okay, so now with that established, uh, watch this 90, this 9,000, this 9, 936 millibar pressure level. We are currently at, you can see the timestamp here, midnight April 3rd. So the uh, midnight before the tornado outbreak, before the super outbreak, and I wanna go forward now to we'll take it to noon april 3rd remember watch that 936 pressure surface right through here through northern alabama so this would be as the tornado outbreak is ongoing or just before i think it had started up here in the ohio valley by noon on april 3rd but look how it is actually retreated northward so the pressures have actually risen uh, the heights have actually risen as you get tremendous warm air advection over this region right through here. Remember, when you have a strong amount of low-level warm air advection, your pressures fall below that low-level jet and rise or below the warm air advection 
and rise above. So if your low level jet is located at 850 millibars, you're going to have pressure falls at the surface and then pressure rises above that and that's exa or height rises above that and that's exactly what has happened. Yeah, um, go back, we'll just toggle between the two. So 936, this is at midnight April 3rd. At uh, noon April 3rd, the heights have risen over the thread area. And if we go to, um, we'll just, yeah, uh, four o'clock, 21Z, I don't know, I guess they don't have a, a plot for that at 300 millibars. And then at, or on this particular reanalysis uh, data. Okay, let's go to zero Z. So that would be 7 p.m. Um, on April 3rd, or uh, zero uh, Z April 4th. And you can see that 936 geopotential meter height contour, GPM height contour, is still there in the same place as it was just three hours prior, or six hours prior, excuse me. And then going forward, I'm just going to take you out to midnight, April 4th. And you can see it changed oh so very little. Look at that. We're just now into north central Alabama, the very northern central part of the state along the Tennessee state line. And that's pretty amazing. So let's toggle between the two. This would be 24 hours prior to this. There's 936. So you, you fell there in a little time span between here, between 0Z April 4 and 6Z April 4, just a little bit. And then we can take it out to 12Z April 4, which would be 7 a.m. the next morning and no change. And that wave just kicked out uh, to the northeast. The short wave did, the long wave trough, you really don't have height falls associated with that. No more than 30 meters of height falls and yet look what happened in the super outbreak of 74. So height falls, uh, honestly guys, in my opinion, they are, in my years of experience, they're overrated. In some cases you need them just because of the setup, the synoptic setup. You know, they, they, they're what's driving the event. But in these situations um, where you don't have significant height falls, in the meteorological community, we refer to those as warm air advection driven tornado outbreaks. You've probably heard that term before if you've been in the meteorological community for a while or, or studied tornado science. And when you hear that term warm air advection tornado driven outbreak, that's or severe weather outbreak, that's what we're referring to instances where the heights don't fall, you don't have that a strong QG forcing, that phylogenetic forcing um, at, a, at a synoptic scale, and warm air advection, isentropic ascent from warm air, warm air advection is causing the ascent and along that slope surface. And so you're getting the rising motion via that way um, and, and through um, differential positive vorticity advection. And the height falls, you just, they're very minimal, if at all. And in some cases, there's actual height rises. And so you have to be really careful. So that's April 3rd, 1974. Um, definitely a warm air advection driven tornado outbreak. Now let's look ahead to March 25th, 2021. Many of you, I'm sure, remember this event uh, just last year. Uh, by the way, the current date is March 28th, 2022. We're expecting severe weather here in the southern Mississippi River Valley, um, including east central Mississippi where I am, uh, Wednesday. So we're under an enhanced risk right now. Been a pretty active season so far. We'll have to see what happens with the remainder of it. I'm pretty concerned. Um, anyway, we've done videos on that. So uh, looking at this event, March 25, 2021. I'm sure many of you remember this event. But right now, let's see where we are. I believe I started this one at 6Z or 7Z on the 25th. So this would be, hang on, bear with me, 2 a.m. on March 25th. And you can see the 9420, so 942 um, geopotential meter height contour right through the Coleman, Alabama, Double Springs, Alabama, uh, Hamilton, Alabama area toward Gadsden, all that area right in through there. So the north central part of the state, but not too far north. Now let's go forward and I want you to watch that, watch this 9420 height contour, watch what happens. We're going to go forward 24 hours, just keep your eye on it. You can see little ripples of energy traveling along in the flow, but look at where that 9420 height contour tour is. It's still 
basically aligned in the same place and it, heights have even risen a bit as that warm air vection kicks in in the low levels and thickens the column a bit. But let's keep going. Thickens the column in a very deep sense, of course. So there's 94.20, still over northwestern Alabama, and we're currently at 5 p.m. on March 25th. So the tornado outbreak, you can see the divergence, the diffluence, uh, divergence plotted here. Of course, divergence is just an expansion of a vector field, and you get rising motion due to the continuity equation, mass continuity, up from the bottom toward the top of the column and the top of the troposphere. So displace mass aloft, you have to bring it in uh, from the surface and rise it up in order to replace that mass that has been evacuated high up in the, in the troposphere, okay? So I'm sure many of you know that, most of you guys know that. So going forward, um, we're gonna look, I think all the way toward five or six Z, there we go, six Z on the 26th. So pretty much a 24 hour period, 23 hour period we covered there. Where's our 9420 geopotential meter contour? still over the northern part of the state. So I'll run through it with you one more time and you can see this example. 94.20, it just, if anything, heights rise, guys. And you can see that the, the gradient of the heights do change as the wave pushes through. Of course, that wave strengthens the front genetical ascent to the west. You do have frontogenesis back in through here. Um, and you have um, ageostrophic thermally indirect circulations that are occurring, <clears throat> excuse me, occurring within this jet street that helps to drive the warm air infection. So there still is frontogenesis happening back here and frontogenetical circulations, jet circulations that are helping to uh, drive the thermal infection and things, but you're still not getting that real strong, those strong height falls. So it's, it's a fascinating discussion because for so many, height falls are so important um, that it, it's a. It, even for me, I, I know that going into this at first, I didn't believe it was possible that you could get to violent tornado outbreaks without height falls until I started actually going back and looking at the cases, and it's like, wow, you know, it's 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 possible and it it, it does occur. So yeah, that's really interesting, and you can see how those heights. Um, across central and north Alabama, just they really don't fall. And so and by this point, the wave is, is well north east of the area, north of the area. And um, of course, this is um, at midnight or 1 a.m. on the 26th. So that's case number two. One more case I'd like to look at with you is April 27, 2011. So almost 11 years ago now. It's hard to believe. Um, this is right before my wife and I got married. We got married on May 14th and North Alabama had just gotten power back after this outbreak about a week before we got married. And so th this, this event, of course, the only super outbreak in my lifetime and the, the uh, trough jet pattern definitely locked and loaded. You uh, keep, you lock the trough base and the wave dives down out of the Pacific Northwest around the trough base which is stationary and right across the thread area and that's exactly what happened that day um, as many of you know so let's take a look at the height progression so this is 1 a.m on april 27th of course you guys know we had that morning qlcs that caused such damage and um, unfortunate loss of life in mississippi and alabama um, it cut off a lot of infrastructure and made things difficult for the afternoon round of supercells anyway you can see uh, let's use this uh, 948 height contour here near Birmingham, Alabama as the example. And we'll go forward. So we will go to 18Z. And you can see it's in the same place. The height gradient to the west is strengthened though. So the area of frontogenesis has encroached on the thread area, which was, as you all know, was right in through here. Um, this is the thread area. So you have that frontogenesis that is is kind of the outer eastern fringes of the area of frontogenesis in the mid levels is encroaching or moving right up to the thread area of severe weather. It's right on the edge of it. And that helps to um, produce those um, frontogenetical circulations or thermally indirect adiostrophic circulations there at the exit region of the upper jet. Um, the exit region, of, you know, probably right in through here at this time. And that alone helps to provide ascent. 
and we could go more into the jet dynamics and all that, but we'll save that for another day. Anyway, the height gradient does tighten to the west, but you still don't have height falls over the core of the outbreak region, which is right in through here, east central Mississippi, central northern Alabama into eastern Tennessee, and the um, western North Carolina, and, and especially western Virginia. So anyway, that's at uh, 1 p.m. Well, let's go now to 0Z on the 28th, and you can still see that 948 GPM contour still there, tightening height gradient to the west, but remember the wave, the short wave, is pushing up this way to the northeast now, beginning to um, eject out of the thread area. So heights, they just really don't fall, guys, across especially central Alabama. Northern Alabama had slight height falls, and then heights begin to relax again as the, um, the wave de-amplifies as the system uh, pushes up uh, the Appalachians. So amazing, we'll review this real quick for this case. The 948 GPM height contour across central Alabama and looking forward to 12Z on the 28th. It's pretty much in the same place and the progression looks like this. You can see there's just really no change. The heights do tighten to the west and northwest of the thread area as the short wave pushes through the impulse. Uh, and then that's it. So um, in, just in review, those are the three cases I have for you today. And, just in review, this is I could just go on and on about this because this is such a cool topic to me. I hope you guys have enjoyed it too. But the next time you're forecasting severe weather, guys, pay real close attention to the upper level height field. And I used 300 millibars. A lot of people use 500. But I used 300 millibars because if you think about, that's generally where the heights change the most. Uh, during in the with the progression of a mid latitude wave at any one location within the wave's path, if you think about a column of sand, uh, three feet tall, uh, you push down on the top of that column. Where is the column going to compress the most? It's going to compress the most at the very top, isn't it? Because um, that's where the mass is going to change the most. Try it sometime. Fill a vial with sand. You know, doesn't matter how how high you really fill it, how much you fill it, but Mash down on that thing at the top and your heights are going to compress the most. You're going to get the greatest change in heights at the top where your hand makes contact with that sand or that substance. And you get less and less compression um, as you go down through the column. And that's exactly like the atmosphere. Your heights change most in the upper levels at the very top of the troposphere, um, the tropospheric layer within Earth's atmosphere. So that's why I chose the 300 millibar level. And uh, so, yeah, really fascinating, guys. I hope y'all have gotten a lot out of this. And so the next time you, you forecast and you're looking at things, see if the heights are forecasted to change much. Um, as you could see in any of these cases, we had no more height change than 30 meters for any of these events. In some cases, the heights actually rose. I know it kind of depends on which time segment you, you, you block it, how you cut your time segments, um, block out your time segments. But anyway, no more than 30 meters change. Of geopotential heights for any of the cases and these are some of the most violent tornado outbreaks on earth the most violent actually uh, two of them so anyway guys um, y'all take care and also whenever you don't have height falls remember you can get repeated rounds of supercells that is one clue that I'm researching um, that can be a sign of repeating or training super tornadic supercells if all the other atmospheric parameters are right for it. Uh, keep that in mind for possible repeating rounds like we saw on April 27th, April 3rd, 74, and March 25th, 2021. All those events featured corridors of repeating supercells across the same region. So that's another possibility. But thanks y'all and have a good one. Take care. I hope this helps.